Testament. First Timothy, the first chapter, verses 12 through 17. You'll find it on page 1846 in your Bible. In it, we find Paul is writing to Timothy. Timothy is a very young pastor, and he's giving him advice. And along with it, he gives his own report of how he became a Christian. It seems in his mind and heart against all odds, but not so. Hear the word of God for us. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considered me faithful, appointing me to his service. Even though I was once a blasphemer, and a persecutor, and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Come to us, Lord. Have your word take hold of our lives. And us receive and enjoy the blessings of Christ given for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So Paul tells us how he came to Christ. And you know, each one of us have your own story about how that happened to you. All the stories are different except for one thing. God's working as standard in our lives. The love of God. It's there at every moment. Today, you've heard Paul's word about how he came to Christ. You're also going to learn how I came to Christ. Well, walking past the store window, my friends, have you ever looked over at the plate glass, seen a reflection, and said, Who's that? And said, Oh my, <laughs> it's me. You've probably done that, I have too. It's amazing the way we uh, see ourselves and how we have others see us. Of course, of supreme importance is how God sees us. Well, that Psalm 14 is a tough one, isn't it? <laughs> it tells us in stark reality the worst of who we can be. We're called fools if we don't believe in God. And by the, by the way, that becomes the standard word for an unbeliever in the Old Testament. It's pretty harsh. We're seen as sinners who roamed far from God, our Creator. But in the New Testament lesson, we find that something has happened. God has lured us back in Jesus Christ. The coming of God can be a scary thing. Old Testament episodes after episode tells about those who approach God and are terrified to be in the presence of God. Moses, in particular, is a vivid reminder of that. Standing before God, he trembles and is fearful, not because of God's negative aspects, but because of God's wonderful aspects and the supreme God of all things. And yet in Timothy, we find a wonderful encouragement. It says, draw near to God, and he'll draw near to you. What a marvelous invitation to go to God, only to have God come to you. That's the advice Paul has for the congregation of Timothy and for Timothy itself, that young pastor. It's an experience that all of us, to varying degrees, have had with great variety, no doubt about it. Although growing up in a Christian home and a Presbyterian church, I really wasn't taught some of the basics. Really wasn't. My parents, were irregular attenders 
and worship. And when I went to them, I didn't go to Sunday school, I sat with them in the pews. And so one day, when I was 10, the pastor approached me and said, George, actually he was from Virginia, he said, George, I haven't seen you in the communicants class. And I said, what's that? He says, that's for young people who are joining the church. All your friends are in it. He named some of them and he was lucky. But because we've been sort of irregular at church, they forgot. They put me on the list of invitations to come and join the class. What happened? The next Sunday, I stood before the church with the others. And I answered all the questions for membership, totally unprepared for what it was like to be a Christian. And yet, I was now a Christian in my own mind, and that's the way it remained for so many years. When I went to college, something happened. I went to college, and the college to which I went was a strongly secular college. No religious group could meet without a faculty member present or an administration member present. We were discouraged from religious activities, but somehow we found a place to meet. By we, I mean the people who invited me to join the InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. It wasn't a difficult decision to go there. Our college had a ratio of seven women to every man. <laughs> sure, I'll go. <laughs> there we studied the Bible, sang hymns, had discussions in fellowship, and soon something started dawning on me. I was active on the campus. I was president of my class, vice president of my fraternity, strong member of the soccer team, had a radio show, and was active in almost everything going on on campus. And yet the question inside me is, Bless you. How come I'm so empty? How come with all this stuff going on, how come? And it was there that I learned the answer. I had grown apart from God. And that was the beginning of something. It was the beginning of realizing that, first of all, I was a sinner. Now, I grew up in a church where that was not a word used very often, unless it was in Scripture. <laughs> we weren't identified as sinners, and I can't remember anyone in the congregation who volunteered to bear that name. And we weren't told how you correct all of that stuff. We were good people, did good work in the community. But I missed that basic stuff. I read somewhere that Someone said once that Jesus comes to us and stands like he's a mirror. And when we look into the mirror of Jesus, we see ourselves as we really are. Not as we want to be seen, not as we hope others see us, but as Jesus, the Son of God, sees us. And I was a sinner. And that is a tough diagnosis, let me tell you. A tough diagnosis to hear that word about who you are. You know. You know the diagnoses are scary things. That happened to me, I know. I've been with you some eight or nine years ago. He's hung around that long. Eight or nine years ago. And I was preaching here regularly on Sundays. And then the doctor called. And he said, in your annual exam, we found your PSA has soared to a dangerous level. And after the diagnoses, he said, you have a very aggressive and difficult case of prostate cancer. Well, what happened from then on was a two-year process whereby through drugs and radiation and such, they treated the ailment one of the things that happened, they, they took most of my test, test, testosterone out and filled it up, ladies, with estrogen. <laughs> <laughs> and one Sunday I was preaching here and I was drenched in sweat. <laughs> and after 
afterwards, one kind woman in the congregation said to me, George, you know, that's not what you think is going on. That wasn't a hot flash. We who experienced it know that it's a power surge. <laughs> a power surge. But you're a took, thank God. That wasn't as scary as what I learned in college halfway through. The diagnosis from God and within myself acknowledging that I was a sinner. And something had to be done. And there's no diagnosis without treatment that follows. Or reverse it. There's no treatment unless you hear the hard story of the diagnosis. I had to come to grips with the fact that I was a sinner. It was not kind of evidence, but that was true. But I also learned the second thing when we draw close to God. Not only do we learn that we're sinners, but we learn that God has the remedy. God has the treatment. So the second thing that happens when you're drawing close to God is, is an encounter with God through Jesus Christ. It just goes his love for a new child, for a different way, fresh and wonderful, individualized. Each one of us have had that encounter, I hope. The New Testament less reminds us that God's mercy is given to us. God says, Wow, you've been far away. Come on home. That's the prodigal son story. It's the prodigal daughter story, too. We're all invited back. And the Heavenly Father is waiting. Waiting patiently. Encouraging us, drawing us closer. Until we finally arrive at home. And then he lavishes upon us all the wonderful things that we've so much needed. The love of God, the presence of God, the new vision we have of the world, the new vision of who we are and who we're supposed to be. Well, and Paul says, so why does God do all this? Why does God take all that trouble? And he says, it's because he wants others, others to see us displayed as showing God's unlimited presence and God's unfailing patience. Give it as a gift to you and me. I don't know if you picked up the words of the anthem, that was basically the theme of the anthem we just had. God's faithfulness. God welcoming us. Come to us. Come to me, God says. Come to us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We have a new life for you. I'm going to give you new lives for the old ones you've had. No matter how satisfying you may have thought, Old one was, you have no imagination as to what could be new in Jesus Christ. Our hymns, our anthem this morning, all point to that same thing, drawing us to God and how it changes our lives forever. We're home again. We're partners with Jesus Christ our Lord. We're given important work to do. No longer aimless in our lives. We know what we're here for. We know what we need to do using our very gifts to accomplish God's work in this world. Our final hymn, too, says something important. I knew the hymn tune, but I hadn't known the lyrics before. But I read them in the light of what Romans 10, 9 says. It is the simplest, most accurate description of what a Christian is. It says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is my Lord and Savior, and believe in your heart, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You are saved. It's a wonderful thing. I'm not leaving. Hold on. Very often, when you sing hymns, you can't do lots of things at the same time. We're busy trying to get the tune right. And very often we miss the lyrics. That was true for me in the hymn that we're having. It's our final hymn. Jesus, what a friend for sinners. I knew the two of them, but these lyrics were new to me, and they they just arrested me. I'm going to read them to you now so you don't miss it. 
when we sing that final hymn. Jesus, what a friend for sinners, lover of my soul. Friends may fail me, foes assail me. He, my Savior, he makes me old. Jesus, what a strength in weakness. Let me hide myself in him. Tempted, tried, and sometimes failed. He, my strength, my victory wins. Jesus, what a help in sorrow. While the billows o'er me roll, even when my heart is breaking, he, my comfort, helps my soul. Jesus, what a guide and keeper. What the tempest stills high, storms about me, night or take me, he, my pilot, hears my cry. Jesus, I do now receive him, more than all in him I find. He has granted me forgiveness. I am his, and he is mine. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we draw close to you, and when we do, those two things happen. We get the bad, bad diagnosis of who we are, but we get the good treatment that makes the difference. It makes us new people in Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of salvation, for the gift of your continuing presence, and your power at work in our lives. We do it all. In Jesus' name, amen. Our hymn is number 255, Beneath the Cross of Jesus. 